Hey there, I'm Erica Allen. And I'm Chris. And we are pastors of a startup church called Horizon Church in Tampa, Florida. And this is New Perspectives. We're going to be taking a look each week, offering new perspectives on age-old problems. We believe that together we can solve some of these age-old problems if we look at our problems in a new way so that we can shine light and ignite change in a world desperate for it. Over the past week, there has been so many stories of people being empty or being even just the fear, the threat of something not being fulfilled in their life. Last week, uh, it was chlorine tablets, which hit my heart completely because our kids love the pool. It's almost fully summertime. School's almost out. And our kids spend, And it's Florida, so yes. it's like 9,000 degrees here oh, all the absolutely. time. Absolutely. <laughs> and there's nothing that wears out our kids more than taking them swimming in the pool every afternoon so they go to bed on time. It is literally like our salvation in the summer is pools. And the threat of not having enough chlorine tablets to toss in the pool was was killing me last week. <laughs> it's devastating. And the news just keeps coming, it feels like, this week. Yeah, um, I, I saw on my Facebook profile um, pictures of folks filling up like plastic containers and plastic trash bags with gas like the number one thing you're not supposed to do is put gas in like plastic bags or plastic containers because it gasoline like literally eats through it uh, but there's this this threat this that there's going to be a gas shortage mm -hmm. in in you know in the united states and so people are filling up their trunks yeah. with this like explosive chemical yeah like a, Let's have extra of it sitting around. Um, yeah, even the, I think it's like the Consumer Safety Board of the U.S. <laughs> government had to tweet out, please don't fill up plastic bags with gas. Um, the, the silliness. Um, and then the two other things that have, have hit close to home this week um, is the lack of chicken wings. Apparently there's a chicken wing shortage coming. Um, and then on top of that, the news that was breaking this morning uh, was that you're now going to be limited to one Chick-fil-A sauce per uh, item, I think, for entree. Um, and I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to have to literally scrounge up some around the house, probably. Hopefully we have some in a drawer because our son likes to have both the Chick-fil-A sauce and the barbecue sauce with his chicken nuggets. Um, and Chris blames it on our four-year-old son, but he also loves a little extra Chick-fil-A sauce. I do, I do. I do uh, <laughs> on everything. I do like buy. to pour it on there. And it's, it's not even really dipping. I, I just dump it all over yes. the place. We love Chick-fil-A sauce at our house. Um, there's not going to be enough Chick-fil-A sauce. What, what is know, this world coming to? Um, I think, so the age-old problem here is just this threat of emptiness. Like, what if there's not enough for us? Um, and I just, I, I think that in that, like, I mean, people do crazy things in, the, mm -hmm. in, this, in this threat of emptiness. We fill up plastic containers with a flammable chemical, like, that could blow us and our houses mm -hmm. up. Like we just start doing things that make zero sense when we're afraid we might come up empty handed at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's sort of the age old problem that we're dealing with. And it's really easy to see what that looks like and laugh about, laugh about it and laugh at people on, on our social media outlets. But what does that look like? Like what about us, you know, mm -hmm. living our everyday life, afraid of being empty handed like what is a new way we can begin to look at this um I, I think before we get to there it might be helpful like so if that if the fear um all those kind of emotions that go with um the emptiness mm -hmm. um what are the ways that we the age-old responses that mm -hmm. haven't been helpful maybe before we get um to well, how we actually deal with it because i know so irrationality seems to be um <laughs> Uh, one of them and hoarding like I yeah in the early days of the COVID pandemic and lockdown I remember there wasn't enough toilet paper like uh -huh. you know we couldn't we were hoarding like literally like cases mm -hmm. of, of toilet paper hand sanitizer was the same way yeah. there were there were guys who like oh yeah bought up all the they were from Tennessee <laughs> I think they drove across the country in a truck and bought hand sanitizer um, and then, like, I think they did get arrested for some sort of federal interstate commerce charges <laughs> for reselling it. But there's even this, like, way that you can, you know, leverage yeah. off of this, like, irrationality that mm. humans have in the face of emptiness. Like, you can literally, like, profit off mm -hmm. of it. Um, so I think hoarding irrationality, like, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the hoarding, because uh, the opposite, even the people that are, filling up water bottles and trash bags in the like Sterilite storage containers. Um, there's the opposite, I think I even saw on the news where 
well, there was a gas station in one of the Carolinas that was charging like six ninety nine a gallon. Um, so I mean, it's just the opposite. And so now they're taking advantage of people uh, when they have gas and selling it to them at a jacked up price. We see that with uh, when the hurricanes come, always with the the price gouging. So I, it's definitely. A, taking advantage of other people. Yeah, there's definitely this classic like economic supply and demand mm -hmm. thing going on, but um, I guess uh, I guess I want to know like how can we do something different as like surely there's a new way to look at this so we don't fall prey to in a lot of ways this supply and demand um, or this irrational way of thinking or responding to things, you know? Yeah. Um, so irrational responses, hoarding, sending our prices skyrocketing, like taking advantage or leveraging, exploiting people it, that who are experiencing emptiness. What are some different ways that we could maybe respond to this threat of emptiness that's like working or, you know, sort of clouding, hanging like a yeah. cloud over us? Well, I think this is uh, where you need a new perspective. All puns mm -hmm. intended right here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so I think you, this is when you get that, that when you are feeling that threat, that fear um, of not having enough, of potentially your gas tank being empty, whether that's literally or figuratively in your own life, mm -hmm. um, the, it, it really does require you taking a step back um, to not immediately jump into reactionary mode. Because I think when you jump immediately, if that's your first step, is to jump into the panic buying of toilet mm. paper, um, you're never going to get, you, it's going to be tougher to get out of that cycle at least. Yeah, on Sunday, we read a story about Jesus' first miracle. He turns water into wine. Mm -hmm. And um, there was this moment, I, I imagined as a person who's been married and been at a wedding, like there is nothing that you want more than for the food table to still have food on it, even at the end of the party. Like you don't want it to go empty and there to be enough mm -hmm. drinks yeah. <laughs> for everyone. Like I remember that being important to me as a bride um, a long time ago. We won't talk about how long ago right now, but the, like it's very important to have sort of enough at a party um, and at this party that Jesus is at, he's a 30 year old dude. He's like not officially like, you know, started his ministry yet. So people like know who he is. He knows who mm -hmm. he is, but other people don't know him yet yeah. as the Messiah or the savior. Um, but there comes this moment, like, they, so they invite him to their wedding. Like he's just yeah. a normal 30 year old guy that they invite to the wedding. He, he's got his disciples, like his best friends who he's just met a couple weeks ago, like are with him. So it's this like gang of 12 guys and Jesus hanging out at a wedding and all of a the sudden there's exactly what you say people jump into panic mode because there's not enough wine at this wedding so there's this like threat of emptiness oh no like what are we going to do there's not enough wine and Jesus's mom calls Jesus over because she knows who can fix the problem Jesus and so um, I wonder if that might be a perspective change for us um, that we think us humans can fix all of these problems, mm. but the, in the taking a step back and getting sort of out of the panic mode, how do we recognize that we may not have all the solutions to the emptiness in front of us, yeah. but we serve a God who knows what to do with emptiness. Um, and I think just acknowledging, I think that was a very like brilliant move on Mary, the mother of Jesus. I think that's brilliant that she was like, let's take a step back and let's call on someone who does know what to do with this empty problem. Mm -hmm. we're dealing with um, have, have you experienced that in your own life when you've like faced emptiness and you have this opportunity to turn to panic like just sort of get wrapped up in panic mode um, how have you stepped back and trusted God maybe even with that emptiness how have you been able to do that in your own life uh, so this I feel like is something that comes a little bit more easily to me so I don't always have a good system for this in my own life because uh, I, I do find myself being a little calmer at, at, uh, at, at these crisis moments. For those of you who are just listening to this, I have bright red hair and the temper and the panic mode. Like, I kind of live my life this way. Um, Chris is a little calmer about it. So um, I, I, I know he will offer a new perspective to those of us who automatically jump into panic mode when things aren't like we intend for them yeah. to be. Um, so I think anything I say along the way, I ask for some extra clarification, because I, I think I can gloss over this a little too easily. Mm -hmm. um, but for me to not jump into that panic mode is, 
first, I think I, ha I have a sense of a strong grounding in, in my faith that, um, that there is something beyond what I can see today, um, that God is still working something out. Um, and so even if this hasn't gone how I wanted it, this door didn't open, I don't think that's the end of my story. I love that, and I'm glad you shared that, because I think for people like me, who it is not my natural inclination to step back and trust God, even though I'm a pastor and I'm a Christian and I believe in God, all of those things, my first inclination is to panic, but we don't have to do this life alone. Like, mm -hmm. even Jesus at the party at that moment, like, has Mary to say, hey, you can fix this problem. Like, the wedding yeah. couple, the, the wedding host, the party host, like, they have Mary who maybe can do that, like, you know, 30 years before that. She yeah. absolutely could have been in panic mode, having a baby in the middle of a census and the world, like, falling apart. And instead, she stepped back and trusted God. So people knew her to be that. Um, and I, I, that's a really good point that I've never thought about in the story. Mm. Like, someone knew to come to her because yeah. she's a person who, in the face of emptiness, can say, take a step back, let's look at this, yeah. with, a, with a different perspective, a faith and a trust in God. Yeah. So I think that's really important. Like, who are the friends that you are calling mm -hmm. who have that kind of perspective that yeah. they can offer for you and for your I life? I mean, and even um, Jesus used the waiters to, the, you know, made sure that the, mm. the jars were full. Um, so yeah, wasn't he, call, he calls six servants, yeah. or he calls a couple servants and says, fill, fill up these six, like, huge yeah. gallon jug thing. They're like, like, I think they're like about 50 gallons. Yeah. Right <laughs> fill that up with water, not yeah. gasoline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Put water in it, and I'm going to do something yeah. amazing. I guess some people were praying for a water to gasoline miracle this week. <laughs> um, That's so funny. <laughs> uh, I think that the second thing for me, um, and it kind of got along with the story as well, is... To step, when you step back, I also see opportunities that I hadn't seen before, as mm -hmm. opposed to like there was this one way, like the only way we can solve, we can have our pool this summer is if we have these little chlorine tablets. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember hearing on the news when they were telling that there might be a shortage, they were like, well, you can use liquid, you might have to use liquid chlorine, or you could you know, transition to like a saltwater pool this summer if you had to. Um, but it, I think when if you only hear that first part of the news, you're like, I literally was about to call Grandpa and be like, Grandpa, go to the pool supply store and buy up all of the chlorine tablets because we're going swimming this summer. Um, but if you take that step back of like, oh, there, we can solve this in other ways. It's only like one part of the problem is yeah. this little tablet um, and we can still go swimming. And I think we do that in our own life. We get so fixated on that one thing. If it doesn't mm -hmm. work out how we wanted, we miss the like three other things that did happen um, that we can take a step forward with. Yeah, even in, I'm so glad you said that too, because even at the party, like it could have kept, you can party with water, like you don't need wine for a party. It, it's a really yeah. nice luxury, but in the moment Jesus said, fill it up with wine, or fill the jugs up with water, not with wine, fill them up with water. Like, I, I think there's this sense to which we think the only way the party can go on is if we have enough wine here right now. And Jesus is like, let's try water out. And then he miraculously and yeah. powerfully turns it in to something else that's amazing. Um, but that's a really helpful way to look at, like this is the only way I can move forward is this one way. And if that doesn't work out, then I'm stuck. But there are like three or four, maybe more options or pack your family up and go to the beach. We live in Tampa, Florida, 20 minutes from yeah. the ocean. Like we could figure out a way to get our kids in some water and experience yeah. some cool things this summer. Um, that's really good. So. So two ways that I think um, you've helped us look at an age-old problem of the threat of emptiness is first surround yourself with people who look at a prop who can look at a problem differently because when you're in panic mode, it's really hard for you to focus on anything else. So have that community around you, that support group around you who can help you look mm -hmm. at problems different. And the second thing is to look at opportunity um, and not just the threat of the emptiness. Um, and if you can't do that on your own, it's probably helpful to find some other people who can do that. Can you tell us about a time um, maybe that you helped someone else look at an opportunity when it was panic mode time? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. It's not you. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk about me. <laughs> Just be careful because I will edit this out. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, pa not panic mode time. Um, So the one moment I think of 
when you ask that question that just does stand, stand head and shoulders beyond everything else uh, is the time when we adopted our son David. Um, there was a lot of conversations ahead of time. Um, like, so literally, I mean, like, we're like minutes away from the hospital. We got a phone call um, about 12 hours before we met him. We lived in Nashville, Tennessee at the time, had to drive 12 hours away. Yeah, and so at this point, like, we're literally, you know, just minutes away from the hospital. And we had no idea this was coming. And Erica, now at this point, who was probably 110% into doing this mm -hmm. and I was like 90 maybe <laughs> uh, was now like 30% into this and was now trying to convince me like we shouldn't do this we should just drive back to Nashville like it's fine like let's just go back um, it was scary it was scary oh yeah um, and so I for me in that moment the fear and maybe, I mean, I sense it's an emptiness, that you weren't going to be enough of a mom. Yep. Um, or you couldn't be the parent that, you, that this child needed in his life. Yep. Uh, I think took over. And it was like, I had to help you. And we actually went to water. <laughs> you, uh, you won't, I, the only other place I could convince you to go, because we weren't going back to Nashville, and you wouldn't let me take you to the, the, the rest of the way to the hospital uh, to meet David at that point. So we went to the beach. Uh, we drove past the beach. And I think that was about the only thing that could convince you um, that there was something mightier that was going to happen. And some phone calls and text messages from friends. There's just, um, I'm glad you said that because there is this sense, for those of you who are moms that are tuning in right now, there's just this sense every step along the parenting journey where you don't feel like you're mom enough. Um, and you have to have people around you who will say, you are enough, you are enough, you are enough over and over and over again um, because our kids like that's just that's something we can literally like begin to fuse into the DNA of our children is yeah. that you're not enough um, but you're never gonna feel like you're enough you're not gonna ever feel like you're enough to start a new adventure or start a new business to become a parent like every moment where you stand on this sort of cusp of something new there's always this threat of mm -hmm. at the end of this I could come up empty-handed yeah um, and that's really scary. So I'm glad you reminded me how scary and fearful <laughs> that that can be. Um, and it was great. Like it was the opportunity of, of having a son who's as amazing as our kid is. Um, what a gift that is. God always has something for you in the emptiness. There was, <laughs> you know, that's the story of Easter. Everybody yeah. like, this threat of an empty tomb is like the absolute yeah. scariest thing ever. And um, I, I hope in that moment we can think of, in the moments of emptiness, we can think about like how empty like death and grief and pain and shame and failure, like all of those things leave us feeling so empty. And there is a God through Jesus who mm -hmm. just has hope and opportunity for us in the face of empty. That's been the story of like all of creation. Yeah. Um, if we can have that new perspective, when we look at emptiness, if we can start to look at it in a new way, in a hopeful way, um, and not as such a threat, I think it will help us shine light mm -hmm. and ignite change in a world desperate for that new way of living. Yeah. Yeah, I, the more we've sat here, and I've been, my brain's been running through all the stories of Scripture, there just seems to be an overwhelming number of folks that had struggled with feeling empty or feeling like they didn't get enough of something, yep. um, whether from very, the very start in Genesis um, to, um, you know, all the, the stories of Jacob and Joseph, um, you know, all the way to the, the other stories of, of Jesus with the five loaves and two fishes that, you know, the disciples were like, there's not enough. It's yeah. empty. Like, <laughs> we're not going to have enough fish and, um, fish yeah. and bread for all the people. They're going to be hangry. Like, there's an opportunity here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's an opportunity to show, like, what I do in the face mm -hmm. of emptiness. And it's what, it's what God's done in, in our lives. We, we know the stories of people in churches for over a decade of mm -hmm. ministry now um, who have brought their emptiness, you know, a life completely emptied out because of addiction and who found recovery, the opportunity for healing and recovery and who are living like just amazing stories now because of it. We've seen people come emptied out from their jobs, like job loss and financial loss, who experience through God, like only God can do something 
in that emptiness and you got to have people around you and you got to be able mm -hmm. to look at the opportunity and you can only do that through the grace like this power yeah. of god giving you a new way to look at your problems that's really helpful so this week um, if you are dealing with emptiness, if you are absolutely scared to death because you are afraid that you will come up empty-handed, maybe you are living empty-handed, there is a new way to look at your problem. Tell somebody around you. They'll help you get a new perspective, a new way to look at this and depend on God who's ready to give you, a, give you something in the place of your emptiness that will be far greater than what you imagined it being full of anyway. Um, because... I have to imagine those servants who went and filled up those gallon jugs of water, like expected Jesus to just serve everybody water, and instead Jesus served them not just good wine, like mm -hmm. the greatest the wine. The best wine. Yeah. yeah, it was like so tasty and yummy, they say, in the, this story. So I think that's an important thing for us to remember. Jesus is ready to interrupt sort of your panic mode with some hope and opportunity, um, and we hope you can find that. Yeah. This week. Thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to connecting with you next week on New Perspectives.